I was there. I did the on aging. We have our, uh, one of our commission members, Amy, Sil uh, Amy Silliman, here with us as well. So thank you, Amy. This was an idea to have Attorney General Tong here to talk more about um, the Elder Justice Hotline and all that goes along with that. So I hope you all enjoy the presentation, and I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I just think <laughs> we'll give him a double introduction. But I also wanted to introduce Matt Fitzsimmons back there. He's a Windsor boy and he works in the Attorney General's office. So um, our Attorney General has good taste, doesn't he? Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just really excited to have him. As you know, he covers the whole, sa whole state and has so much to do. And he's been able to come out to Windsor. Um, I actually had to look it up because people, I mean, we know what the Attorney General does, but just more specifically, he serves as counselor to the state government agencies, to us in the legislature. I'm your lawyer. That <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is. And um, he's, a re he's a representative of your interest, of the public interest. So I'm so excited. We know that um, we have a huge issue. Um, with security and all kinds of things, and we're just happy to have him here today. And with my co-introducer, Mayor Trix, who's standing in the back gap. With that, I'll present the attorney. Thank you. <laughs> Mayor, did you want to say anything just to welcome? Listen, Jane's doing so many of these that uh, they're tired of me. <laughs> you're, you're the headliner. Nobody is tired of the mayor. Um, I wish the mayor were, were not decided to spend more time with his grandchildren, but it's well deserved. Um, as you may know, the mayor uh, sold his restaurant, which I'm very disappointed by. It was a wonderful hot dog, fried clams. Uh, there aren't that many places like, like the mayor's place anymore, so uh, it's a real loss for this community, but um, thank you, Mayor Tranks. Thank you for your incredible service to the people of Windsor. Uh, thank you, Representative Garibay. We've done a lot together. We've done some things on housing and, and a variety of other issues. Um, so good to be with Jane today. Um, thank you, Rebecca and Stephanie, for putting this program together and for uh, this great senior center and all the programming that you do um, throughout the year. Yes, Matt Fitzsimmons is chief counsel to the Attorney General. So he's my lawyer. And and now he has a new name in the office, Windsor Boy. Oh. <laughs> That's your fault, Jay. <laughs> That's going to get annoying really quick. Uh, let me introduce 
introduce you to a couple of other folks. Um, Sandra Arenas is the Associate Attorney General and, and Chief of the Division in Charge of Constituent Services. So that means when you need something, you call Sandy. Um, and Sandy has a whole team of people that helps people with all manner of issues. Uh, uh, we were talking earlier about travel issues and the airlines, and um, we help with that, we help with Department of Social Services. We help with a variety of things. We have our intern Ellie here as well, who's helping Sandy today. So if you have a specific issue, feel free to, to grab Sandy on, on the way out. Um, it's good to be in Windsor. I, um, I represent the Stanford area for 12 years in legislature. So I'm from the other end of the state, but I'm not actually from the other end of the state. I was born in Hartford Hospital and, and grew up in West Hartford, and my parents lived in Glastonbury. And I, as I was driving in, I, I recalled, I know we're not in Windsor Locks, but um, I recalled that one of my earliest memories was going with my now 99-year-old grandmother. Oh. Who's doing very well. Yes. So Landy, um, she lives in Glastonbury too. One of my earliest memories was going to Bradley Airport with her to take a flight to go see my grandfather who worked in Maryland, her husband, um, for the US Army. And I had this hazy recollection, it seems almost quaint, that there was like a little snack bar at Bradley um, with one of those old style popcorn machines. Uh, feels like, and that's all they had then, right? And now Bradley's you know, TSA and all of that, right? Um, but, but great to be with all of you and, um, and to share some thoughts about how you can all protect yourselves and, and what to watch out for. Um, because it's it's a different world out there, isn't That's it? That's for sure. Mm -hmm. So, yes. let me ask you, um, why do you think people target seniors and older Americans for scams? They're vulnerable. They're vulnerable, right? Uh, um, we care about family. You're trustworthy, you care about family, maybe mobility is an issue. Lonely. Faulty memory. <laughs> Speak for yourself, right? Speak for yourself. I'm not gonna repeat that one. What else? Lonely. We're gonna talk about that in a second. They more likely to have money. That's the one. You have money. It may not feel like it. I get that. But 20 year olds don't have money. No. Your grandkids don't have money. Right? People who are trying to put kids through college, they don't have money. But when you're Don Tricks and you sold your business, you got some money. <laughs> right? And so that's why they, they target older Americans. And so today I want to share some thoughts about how to protect yourself and who to call. Um, we discovered that um, seniors are not only victims of scams, but increasingly um, are victims of financial fraud and abuse, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. And it's because of that that uh, we want to make sure that that older Americans know where to turn when they have an issue. And, and I think the problem all of you know, I think Jane and and Don know, um, when you got to call the state, it's like good luck figuring out which number to call. <laughs> right? If you ask the attorney general who to call. I Maybe I could tell you two or three agencies, but I wouldn't know their number. I wouldn't know who the person is because it's a dizzying web of different social service agencies, state agencies. By the way, there are a lot of people that provide a lot of services. And, and, and so I think people sometimes uh, unfairly criticize government in that there are you know, too, too many people, they're too inefficient. The truth is there are a lot of people ready to help. The tough thing is getting to them and figuring out who it is. So uh, that's why today we handed out a flyer, so you don't have to write it down, where there's a phone number on it. You see the phone number is 860-808-5555. That's the Elder Justice Hotline. That rings in my office. 
So what we said, we work with the Elder Justice Coalition. There's a group of social service agencies. I mean, I know your senior services folks are plugged into it. So there's a, there's a coalition of different agencies and different officials. And they said, we need, we need one-stop shopping. We need one number that people can call. And um, that number rings in my office. And it's Sandy's team that picks up the phone. So if you have an issue, call our office. If we can help you ourselves, we'll do that. If we, if we need someone else's help, we'll call them and bring them in. And then of course, if we can't help, um, we'll be honest about it and tell you that we can't. Um, but most of the time, we will try to find a way um, to give you a hand uh, and do more than point you in the right direction. We'll try to find the right person in state government or town government um, who can help you. So uh, that's why we're here today is to let you know about the hotline and, and to talk about um, all the different ways in which you need to protect yourselves. So let's talk about scams to start. So what do you think some of the most common scams are? Granddaughter has been stolen. Yes, yeah. the grandparent scam. Okay, everybody knows about the grandparent scam. So, if somebody calls claiming to be your granddaughter, take a deep breath, right? Listen to what they're saying, and if it's clear that it's not her, hang up the phone. And then call your granddaughter, or call your son or daughter who's their parent, and figure it out for yourself. Understand that, in a sec, understand that in this day and age, one of the big risks is they're increasingly sophisticated. Okay, right. So what can they do, right? So what can they do? They can go on social media and figure out name, rank, serial number, height, weight, right? If they're traveling, you'll see on Facebook or Instagram, the kids use Instagram. Um, you know, grandson or granddaughter is in Italy, right? So they know these things. Um, and they can use AI now, artificial intelligence, to impersonate their voice. Super scary. Okay? So what can you do about it? First of all, don't pick up a number you don't recognize. Okay? Number two, don't think you're smarter than the scammer. I get a lot of people like, oh, I was a PhD in such and such before I retired, or I was a lawyer, I was a doctor, and I'm smarter than they are. No, you're not. <laughs> right? Right? They're one step ahead of, of you, and while they're talking to you on the phone, they're probably getting information you don't think you're giving up. Okay? So, so don't stay on the phone. Um, don't give them information. One tip that seems a little too much, but I think it's worth doing, next time at a family dinner, just decide on a word that only you all know, like buttercup, right? And that way your, grandma, your grandson, granddaughter, son or daughter knows if they're in trouble and they call you and they say buttercup, you know it's them. That, does that seem like a little too much? Maybe, nope. but is it a big deal for you to talk about that at the dinner table? No, of course not. So the grandparent scam, related scams, okay, to the grandparent scam, all impersonating somebody else, right? So the Eversource or United Illuminating scam. They'll, they've now, you, using AI and technology, they've now cloned the sound of the automated operator, right? If you call Eversource or United Illuminating, so there's a voice, it's a recognizable voice, they'll clone that. Um, they'll call and say, you owe the town of Windsor X dollars for your property taxes or some fee, okay? Uh, so, and often they'll call uh, from, from a charity, Save the Children or, you know, Town of Windsor Fire Department, Police Department, uh, whoever it is, okay, know a couple things. Number one, no legitimate government agency or utility is going to call you and ask you for money right then and there. So never give out your credit card information, right? If, if, if they give you information that sounds sort of familiar and you're not sure, write it down, thank you very much, hang up the phone, and then you call the town of Windsor, or you call Eversource or United Illuminating. Um, or if they want money for a charity, thank you very much, hang up the phone. If you want to give, and by all means do give, but if you want to give to Save the Children, 
or to Windsor you know, Police Benevolent Fund, you call them yourselves and say, hi, I'd like to give on your own initiative. Don't respond to a solicitation. That includes phone, email, right, text. Right? They come at us in many different ways. And know, just know that um, they're clever. So anybody ever get called from their own phone number? using someone else's um, phone number. Nobody is immune. There's a scam for everyone. And, and, and um, you know, my mom got scammed, $5,000. She, she's about as tough and savvy an immigrant businesswoman as you will ever meet. She got scammed. One of the one of the toughest scams that um, we've heard of that it was just heartbreaking was a gentleman not too far from here in Hartford, and uh, Sandy was involved in this one. He uh, he had trouble with his his computer, so he you know looked on the Google machine for somebody to fix his computer, and he found some guy some company, and. Um, they charged him 300 bucks and they fixed his computer and it was great. They called back uh, sometime afterwards and said, hey, um, if you're willing to vouch for us that you liked our service, um, we'd like to give you your money back. You know, we're just running this promotion and it was just 300 bucks and we'd like to give it back to you and thank you for using us. Maybe you'll use us again and speak well of us. And he said, okay, sure. Um, and, and they said, uh, well, we want to wire you the money, so why don't you give us your name and your bank account information? Oh. Okay? And, and so he said, okay, and so they did. So, um, so fast forward uh, another you know, few days or so, and they call back again, and they said, oh, geez. We wanted to wire you 300 bucks. We wired you $20,000 by mistake, okay? Now, now this is a smart guy, right? So the guy says, all right, now this is getting to be a little bit crazy, right? I'm starting to doubt what I'm hearing. Thank you very much, hangs up the phone and checks his bank account. Sure enough, there's 20 grand in his checking account that wasn't there yesterday, okay? So he says, ah, oh, they must have really screwed this up. So he sends the 20 grand back to them. Oh. It turns out they'd hacked his account. They transferred 20,000 from his savings account to his checking account. Oh, my he gave them back his own money. Oh. So they're pretty sophisticated. Uh, let me ask you, you talked about it. Let me ask you, what do you think the number one scam is for people over 60 in this country? Number one, it's not the grandparent scan, just a hint. Is it the link on your cell phone where don't ever, my the, grandson say don't ever click don't that? Don't ever link. click the link, that's called phishing, P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G. Quick aside, to tell you, to show you how nobody is immune, I was at my computer, I got a, an, an email from the State of Connecticut Department of Information Technology. Okay, with a link, we're doing a security test. Please participate in the security test. And I clicked on the link. Uh -huh. A few minutes later, the head of IT for the office of the Attorney General came in my office and said, Mr. Attorney General, you just failed the security test. <laughs> Matt did too. Uh, so, so nobody's immune. But what's the number one scam affecting people over 60? Is it winning, being told you've won a lot of money? That, and that's, up money get the money? that's up there. That's up there. It's the romance scam. Because people are lonely. Why is it 
is so effective because it's really easy to find out whether somebody is recently single. Oh, no. Right? Everything's so, out there. Everything's out there, but, but you've been with this guy for 40 years. Finally, you kicked the bastard out, right? <laughs> and you go on Facebook and you say, I'm free, right? Everybody knows it. Or, you know, um, as happens, you know, in life, you lose a spouse or a partner, and that's all over the internet and the papers, right? These people read social media, they read obituaries, they know who's recently single, and then they, they target them. And, and they start a relationship, and uh, usually the tail on these is very long. It's not like a quick scam, right? They'll invest some time in it, and they'll send you pictures and give you information, and you know, a year or two passes, and then here's what to look out for. Uh, they say, oh, I wanna come see you. Okay, great. I bought the plane ticket. Great, and so you've been talking to this person for two years, you're gonna see them finally. It's like Fabrizio in Italy, right? It's these wonderful <laughs> pictures, right? And Fabrizio calls and says, I can't, I can't come see you because I crashed my car or my mom is sick. But if I had $20,000, you know, to take care of mom or fix my car, I can still come, I can still make my flight. That's that high pressure tactic at that moment when you're most vulnerable that people get taken advantage of. So I, I say this because of course it will happen to nobody in this room, right? But look, it, it, these sorts of things happen all the time. They may happen to somebody that you know, right? And, and we're putting this information out there so that everybody is just aware. Everybody, anybody is vulnerable at any moment, just depending on if they get you at the right time, right? If, you're, if you had a bad day, if you had a bad week, if you lost somebody, if you lost a job, right? Everybody will have tough moments and that's when you're most vulnerable. So uh, the best way to protect yourself from a scam is not to get scammed in the first place. Because most of these folks are not in, in, in Connecticut or not in this country. They're overseas. Yes. They got a laptop and internet connection and, and that's easy for them and cheap for them to perpetrate a scam. So, so if you don't recognize a phone number, don't pick it up. Don't stay on the phone with somebody who you don't know who may be trying to scam you, right? Nobody's gonna ask you for money on the spot. Don't give them your credit card. Don't give out more information than you have to on the internet. Okay, don't fill out surveys, you know, for for a, a promotion or a raffle. Um, even if you're buying something off a, a legitimate website, they'll often ask for more information than they than they need. Don't give it to them, right? Just give the bare minimum to complete your transaction. By the way, this is not to say don't use the internet or not don't use your devices. Of course, we all do. Right? So much of our lives are lived online. And, by the way, these kids today meet each other over the internet, and older Americans do too. So it's okay, right, to, to meet people online, and if you're looking for love, great. Just be careful, right? Just be careful. Know that there's a scam for everyone, including my mom, and, and, and if you protect yourself, that'll go a long way. If you find yourself on uh, being scammed or, or you suspect you might have been scammed, call the number, call 860-808-5555 or call the police and uh, we will try to help. Let me talk about something that's always hard to talk about but um, is really important to talk about. Financial fraud, okay. Um, so there are scams uh, but, but um, but then there are, are large-scale frauds that um, are perpetrated by people, usually close to the victim, okay? So in, in most cases, um, a majority of cases, 53% of cases, when somebody takes advantage of another person who's uh, an older American, over 60, in, in, in a majority of cases, it's somebody close to them. You know, it's a son or a daughter, a niece or a nephew, a grandchild. And it usually starts out as, 
you know, my son's a good boy, he's had a little trouble, right? And he's trying to get his life together, but he's in a jam, and I'm gonna help him out with a thousand dollars. Right? Just to help him pay the rent. A thousand becomes five thousand, becomes ten thousand, right? And and before long, um, you've given out a lot of money. The other the other thing that we see, um, which is really sad, is often the, perpen, the person who takes advantage of the other person, the perpetrator, the wrongdoer, that person is not only someone who's closely related to them, but it's somebody that, um, that, the, older, that the older person depends on, right? Like usually you have a mom or a dad or a grandparent who depends on the other person for, for mobility, drive them around, go to the supermarket, go to the senior center, right, pay their bills. And that's why so much of this is hardly ever reported, okay? Um, only, uh, I think, in, in, in cases of um, financial fraud, only one in 44 cases gets reported. Why? It's embarrassing. But because you don't want to rat out, you don't want to get in trouble. That's your son or your daughter. Right? And so people are naturally reluctant to report uh, billions of dollars, 36.5 billion estimated every single year in this country. And you know that number is underreported because people don't report. So the first step is knowing that it happens. The second step is knowing that it happens all the time, okay? And it's not okay. It's not okay. It is, it is a criminal act, it is against the law. It is not okay. No matter who that person is, son, daughter, niece, nephew, it is not okay. But I know it's really hard for people to take action to protect themselves. So my advice is if you're the victim or suspect that you may be the victim of financial fraud, um, call the number. Even if you're not willing to give your name right away, Sandy and her team can give you additional resources, somebody else to call, right, who may be able to provide some counseling, um, and, and, and just start the conversation, even if you don't want to give your name away. Um, if you know somebody who is the victim of financial fraud or, or, or abuse, please call the number, tell them I got a friend, and we can put you in touch with somebody who can help you talk to that person using the right language and the right approach to get them to help themselves. So don't just let it happen. Please call us and, and let us try to help you. The other thing I want to say is um, physical abuse is real. And um, it's, it's hard for me to actually fathom that it happens sometimes, but it does happen. Again, the same rules apply. More than 60%, so even a bigger number, of physical abuse cases are at the hands of somebody close to the victim. Again, son, daughter, niece, nephew, spouse, right? So physical abuse is, is real. Uh, one in 10 adults in this country are physically abused, um, seniors, and only one in 23 cases gets, ever gets reported. Uh, so the key thing here, again, is to make a call. And even if you don't want to give your name away, start the conversation with the Elder Justice Hotline. And if you need a lawyer, if you need to reach out to law enforcement, we can help you connect with the right people. And again, if somebody else um, that you know close to you may be the victim of physical abuse, um, get them to call. Or again, you can call and say, how can I, what's your advice on how to get through to this person? There is a unit in the Department of Social Services called the um, Elderly Protective Services Unit. So we have a unit that protects seniors from physical abuse. Um, but it only happens if we know about it. So again, start the conversation, even if you don't want to give your name right away, um, and we'll respect your confidentiality. It's important to start the conversation. Yes, you have a quick question. So I'm a geriatric care manager and registered nurse, uh, and I'm glad you brought up the uh, elder abuse hotline. The problem with them is that they will 
outright tell you they don't get involved with anything financial at all. So it's good to have this number. Yes. But oftentimes, people's first response is to call them, and then they'll say, we don't get involved in that. Um, they do get involved pretty quickly with things, I will say that much, and as much as people are afraid of them, I find them to be extremely helpful for someone who is kind of stuck. Yeah. To kind of jump in and do what they need to do. Yeah. But that piece of it, like, bothers me because they don't say, call you. They just say, oh, we don't get involved in financial stuff. So, um, start with us. And I hear you on that, and, and we will try to find the right people and the right resources to help you through it and not, and not, we recognize that people get stuck and that's the whole point of having a hotline which is to help them help themselves and not get stuck in a place where, where they can't get any help or assistance. So that's some pretty heavy duty stuff. Uh, sorry to bring it up, but you have to, right? That's, it's really important to recognize and talk about this. Let me thank again, Jane and the Senior Center, um, you're really lucky to have Representative Garibay represent you in Hartford. She's a real fighter. Mm. She can be a real pain in the ass sometimes, which is good, which is good, right? Which is good. And, uh, and she's got a Windsor boy now that she can call. And so with that, I'm happy to take some questions. Thank you. Back there. If you don't mind, what was the particular scam that got your mom? Uh, it was the overpayment scam. Oh. So my mom, uh, my mom wishes that I hadn't told the Hartford Current about the overpayment scam. <laughs> uh, she's been outed. So the overpayment scam went like this. Um, my mom and dad, uh, for a while there, and they still do rent some properties to people. And so somebody called from England saying, I'd like to rent an apartment. Okay. Great, send us a security deposit for whatever, $2,000, and we'll rent it to you. The guy sends my mom a check, and it's for like $7,000. And he says, he calls in a bit of a panic and says, oh my gosh, I messed up, and I sent you a check for the wrong amount. And my mom says, yeah, yeah okay, uh, I'll, I'll send it back to you. He says, no, 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 don't worry about it. Why don't you cash that check, right? Keep a little extra for yourself and wire me back the difference. So what did my mom do? She wired him five grand. Oh. Then she goes to cash that check later. Yeah. It's a bad check. Oh. She didn't, you know, people don't. We don't think. You know. Yeah, you know. Now we know. Now we know. Now we know. <laughs> That guy's a little chubby there. Uh, <laughs> how did you get that um, hotline published to more places? Because I used to work with an elderly woman, she says, passed away, who had a real jerk for a son, and she had a hard time paying her medical bills, blah, blah, blah. She was in Windsor Locks. I had to say, call Jane, your representative. <laughs> But I could have called that number. Yeah. Just clarify, I represent everybody. Everybody. So, so that's why we're that's why we're here today. I hope the um, senior center will find a way to put it out to people, maybe by an email. But we're going around one senior center at a time um, to get this information out to people. So, you know, if you if you live in an apartment building um, with a bunch of other seniors, put it up on the bulletin board. And you know, if you need extra copies, we'll give them to you. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Uh, thank you for being here today. And uh, I want to make a point on fiscal abuse that related to seniors. Most of the abuses happen in the home. Yes. The family members. Yes. Now, how do your partner respond to that? Because when the abuse comes at home, maybe the caretaker is overloaded and the victims could not, could not see anything because if it's something against it, it's that they are scared That's right. of the further abuses right. or being sent to those nursing homes. <laughs> nursing homes. So how do you, how do you compromise that? Because, because the caretaker is physically overloaded. Yes. For that reason, if there's no emotional balance, 
between the caretaker and, and the victim, the abuse goes on. So, yes. And since the, the home cannot be a mandatory reporter until they go to an emergency where they can see an unexplained injuries. Because at home, yes. they will not report it. Yeah. How do you address that? And, and let me just also say, can you tell yeah, me yeah, yeah. He was saying that and he was he was he was he was um, adding to what I'd said earlier, um, that a lot of this abuse happens in the home yes. among family members and um, often the the caretaker um, is themselves overloaded, right? And that's not an excuse by the way for abuse, but it it explains where things are coming from, um, and uh, that the person may be scared to report the abuse because they depend on that person, because they're a family member. All these factors are at play. My response to that is, um, that doesn't make the abuse okay, right? And it is still against the law, and nobody should have to suffer abuse, which is why, we give this hotline, okay, for you to call, and and if you're ready to take action to protect yourself, we can put you in touch with the right law enforcement people, right, state, um, the state elderly protective services unit, or local police, or if you're not ready, we can help talk you through ways to protect yourself. But yes, it does require somebody to step out and make a phone call and to protect themselves. We can't help them if they won't help themselves. We try to talk them through it. This is not like children, by the way, okay? Um, if you're a child and you're physically abused and you go to school and the nurse sees that you've been physically abused, the nurse is a mandatory reporter. The nurse has to call, okay? And let somebody in authority know that they see a child who's been abused. You're adults. Right? I don't have any right to tell you what to do any more than you have any right to tell me what to do unless you break the law. Then I have a right. But, but, but we're adults, so it's very hard to take action on behalf of other adults, which is why, again, we set up this hotline to try to make it easier for people to call and to get help. Okay. Well, when you're talking, I was like, you're confused because of my phone. I was just going to ask that. that yes. Mandatory reporter? That's what I'm wondering because he's never helped me. Yeah, uh, it's very complicated with doctors. It depends on, on your situation. Um, and so, you know, I think the best thing to do in that situation is to, to call the hotline uh, or consult a lawyer or to talk to the police about it. Uh, what about helping someone uh, I'm not related to? Call the, hot, call the hotline and we can try to find um, somebody to talk you through how to approach that person, how to get them to help themselves, and what resources there are in their town, right? So if, if you call me and, and you have a problem with somebody in Windsor, it doesn't help for me to get you someone in Stanford, mm -hmm. right? We want to try to find who the right people are in Windsor or the Hartford area or um, in this region to provide some counseling and assistance and to be a resource for them. Yes, and what about when you're being threatened that you can't call the police and you can't do anything because there will be repercussions? Yeah, that's a really that's a really hard situation and it's why I'm here. And and if you're being threatened, the best thing to do is to call the police and an elderly protective services unit and to let them take action to protect you. When you have another um, person in the house who is elderly, and I'm 100% disabled. He is the one that's been attacking me, mm -hmm. on me, mm -hmm. calling the police on me, and there's nothing I can do. Let us get your information afterwards, and let us try to figure out a way to help you. <coughs> yes? If I call your hotline number, how long will I be put on hold? <laughs> Seven. 
But call the hotline and, and we're there for you, we'll get back to you. We wouldn't set up a hotline that we weren't gonna answer. And we wouldn't set up a hotline that we weren't gonna respond to you on. Now, let's be clear. Like, we're gonna be we're gonna be honest with you about what we can help you with and what we can't help you with. Right? And so um, but we wanna help you with 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 financial fraud and abuse, we wanna help you with scams, we wanna help you with accessing social services. There are a lot of things we can do, some things we can't do and we'll tell you. You know? Sometimes people have a legal dispute with a neighbor. Yeah. Right? I can't help you with that, right? That's between you and your neighbor. Or, or you entered into a contract with somebody uh, to do some work, um, and, and there's a dispute about that work. Unless there's been fraud, unless somebody did something criminal, that's also between you and that, that person. So matters between private citizens that don't constitute fraud or abuse uh, or a criminal act, I can't help you with. But I can help you if somebody's done something wrong. There's also the scammer. They're telling for the amount. You go get the amount, and you say, well, I want to see my son. No, no. I need the money. I'll come to your place, pick it up, and then. That's a scam. Oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's a scam. Mm -hmm. Because my husband and I, we went through two of them. Mm -hmm. And the best part was, I have a cell phone, we also have a home phone. We get the home phone, I'm on my cell phone, <laughs> talking to my grandson, <laughs> who was supposed to have been in a hospital. <laughs> and that's not only the thing, he got scammed out himself. But the next day, there was a second scam. It was about my son-in-law. And the person phoned on the home phone, talking to my husband. I'm on my cell phone, talking to my son-in-law. <laughs> and I had a better one, better at it, eh? He hung up the phone. Let me, let me give you one tip. Um, and why it's important not to pick up and not stay on the phone. Exactly. Why is it important not to pick up? Because if you pick up, and you talk to them, they know you pick up. Okay? And the technology knows, okay, this is a live one. There's another human being on the other end of the phone, and they're gonna pick up the phone. And that's when you, you'll notice, if you pick up a scam call and you spend some time with them on the phone, the number of scam calls you get after that increases because they know that you pick up. So I, I know it's hard. I grew up in a time. I, I try to tell my kids when we see a payphone, I'm like, do you know what that is? And they say, oh. <laughs> so I, I, I get it. You know, we um, we're we're sort of by habit trained to pick up the phone because that's what we did for decades and decades. Use your caller ID. I have fought very hard for technology called stir shaken technology, which is the technology that that sorts through and weeds out spam calls. Spam is you know our bad robocalls, and you'll see on your phone potential spam. Yes. That's that technology working. Don't pick up the potential spam, right? Just let the technology work. If somebody really needs to get to you, you know they'll leave a message. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. Or they'll or they'll text you. Yes, ma'am. I'm caught between a uh, rock and a hard place because I have a sister that's very sick, and and I'm kind of well not the guardian of her, but I try to take her calls that she can't handle, and I don't know all the numbers. So I try not, I do not pick up if it says spam likely, but there are numbers that I don't realize, I don't recognize the numbers, and I need to see if this is someone calling about my sister. Mm. Call her ID. There's a call yes. ID and I, test, you can check. And I always say, you know, if it's, if it's not right, you need to message. They'll call back. If it's important, they'll call I, back. I'm they'll guessing. I'm guessing there's no more than 10 numbers that you need to know, okay? And so what you need to do is 
just spend some time with her when she's able mm -hmm. and make sure which family members are going to call, write those numbers down, right? right? And which medical providers, health care providers are going to call, write those numbers down. Right. I think you will find that it's no more than 10, 15 numbers. And if you take an inventory, you can stick to those. And if it's more than that and it's important, they'll leave a message. Right. Right? A couple more. Yeah, last week, uh, Norton had sent me an email saying that thank you for my subscription and they were taking $325 out of my account. But I went to Webster and they told me right away it was a scam. But Norton is a well-known company. I mean, what do you do about that? It's really, it's well, really hard. More. It's really hard, but in most cases, reputable companies now, um, they won't send you a text or an email asking you for money, right? Yeah. Um, what you should do is if you get such an email, you I know it's a pain in the neck, but you should call Norton yourself, again, on your own initiative. Uh -huh. We will get messages from, you know, we use in our family three or four banks for different reasons, right? And, um, and we have more credit cards than we should have, but, but, but we get messages from our banks that aren't really from our banks. Right. Because somebody has figured out that we're a depositor at First County Bank in Stanford. I just give that away, give too much information. And, and, uh, and somebody knows that, and, and I just I don't respond to those, those emails. If I think I have a problem, then, then um, I call them myself. All right? Last one. Last one. Uh, I take care of this lady, and she got a credit card, and she said, oh, I need to call and get my PIN number and to open up, because it says on there, you can't use it unless you dial yes. this number. Well, when she first received it, there was stuff that looked like a scammer, and I told her, I said, I think this is a scammer. She said, no, 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 it's my credit card, and we have been, I have been trying to call that number but every time I get to the last part with the automated person talking, oh, this card does not exist, so I need to go back home today and tell her she's gotten in touch with her credit union. They know nothing about that card. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got in touch with her job that she retired from. They know nothing about that card. And I told her yesterday, I said, three days we've been trying to get in touch with this people to get your pen number, but they keep saying, I'm sorry, you know, we can't deal with this. So, so, no. so call our number, okay, we'll let the Department of Banking know about this issue, okay, with, and then if you're having trouble getting through the actual bank and to fix this problem and you've been on the phone and you've tried, yeah. we can try to make a phone call to see if we can get someone to help you. Oh, okay. Thank you. Sometimes a little phone call from the Office of the Attorney General. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Bernie's got a 1.30 now appointment. We're going to let the Attorney General get on his way and to spread more good news and more good information. Uh, certainly always a good friend of the town of Windsor. <laughs> For being so gracious to come out. Um, there may be Windsor Locks people here also because they were invited um, for the district. But also know that Don and I are here for you, yes. that if you need something. And I know how I'm up there with you, right? <laughs> I'm a senior citizen. And it's very fearful when you think you might lose where you live or you might be worse abused. But we're finding, especially in nursing homes, those that are coming forward with their stories, when the nursing home knows that, they behave much better. It doesn't always go the other way. That's a, And even if it's your loved one, whatever, you don't deserve that abuse. And Correct. there are people there for you. Thank so, you. And thank, thank you. you. And thank you to the Windsor Boy.